at the threshold of knowledge lies the commencement of understanding uncharted territories. Good morning to one and all present here. With great pleasure, we extend a heartfelt welcome to each and every one of you to the Samhita Navachara. The Interdisciplinary Symposium orchestrated by Whitefield Global School under the visionary leadership of our chairman, Dr. C. Purnachandra Rao. We are honored to have you here, sir. It is our immense pleasure to have the presence of our distinguished adjudicator. Mr. Nitin Shastri, Director of Enterprise Content Technology at the London Stock Exchange Group, Mr. Amit Gupta, Vice President of the CK12 Foundation, Dr. Karthik Shastri, Professor at the RV College of Engineering, and Dr. Shweta Panchal, Professor at Vellore Institute of Technology. We also have Dr. Gayatrama and Dr. Mohula as judges from Whitefield Global School. We welcome you all. Our salutations also go to our charismatic director academics, Dr. Sharda Chandrasekharan, our beloved principal, Dr. Sita Shankar, our ever-supportive vice principal, Ms. Deepa S., our dedicated coordinators, quality heads, educators, and dear friends. Can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> the lamp of learning shines brightest when it illuminates the minds of others. On this note, I request the dignitaries to light the lamp. Now I invite Ms. Deepa S., our Vice Principal, to formally welcome our esteemed dignitaries. A very good morning to all the distinguished dignitaries, dear parents, proficient faculty, enthusiastic students. I extend a warm welcome to all of you to this exciting paper presentation event. This gathering marks a celebration of talent, creativity, and the vibrant spirit that our school community represents. Today, we are here to witness the culmination of hard work, innovation, and dedication. As each team takes stage to showcase their remarkable research work, we are in for an inspiring journey of ideas and creativity. Let us embrace this opportunity to learn, connect, and celebrate the achievements that await ahead of us. Thank you all for being a part of this program. Our chairman, Dr. C. Purnachandra Rao, has always instilled in us the importance of research and development. It is his dream and far-sighted thoughts which has taken the shape of innovation cell in our school. Sir believes in bringing in an awareness among our students about the importance of having a growth mindset. A warm welcome to our visionary chairman to this August gathering. May I request Principal Dr. Sita Shankar. 
to formally welcome Chairman Sir. Thank you, ma'am. We are extremely privileged to have amidst us four eminent personalities from the fields of technology, microbiology, and physics to be a part of today's event and guide our students in their pursuit of excellence. Mr. Amit Gupta, an accomplished technology leader with 25 plus years of experience at the forefront of innovative software product development. He currently heads the team at CK12 Foundation India, working on technology and educational content platform that can change how we learn. At, earlier at Amazon Adobe, he managed the development of software solutions that simplified publishing on Kindle platform and provided pivotal management and development leadership for popular Adobe video products. He pioneered Adobe script writing tool into indispensable tools for creating TV productions at broadcasters like BBC and ITV. A graduate of mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, Mr. Amit combines his inquisitiveness in graphics, robotics, and high-scale internet applications in, with a pioneering spirit, earning him innovative patents recognized by the US Patent Office. During his free time, Mr. Amit enjoys being a maker, engaging in an array of do-it-yourself projects that brings life to his diverse interests and experiences. He believes that learning for everyone goes much beyond classrooms, and with passion and perseverance, nothing is beyond anyone's reach. A hearty welcome to you, Mr. Amit. May I request our chairman, sir, to formally welcome Mr. Amit. Our next distinguished guest, Dr. Shweta Panchal, is currently working as an associate professor at School of Biosciences and Technology, Vellore Institute of Technology, Vellore, where she is engaged in teaching various subjects like microbiology, microbial biotechnology, plant biotechnology, and in guiding PhD scholars. She obtained her PhD degree from University of Texas, Arlington, USA, specializing in plant pathology and MSc in microbiology from Maharaja Sayori, Sayoji Rao University, Baroda. Post PhD, she went on to complete two postdoctoral stints, one with Professor Bharat Chattu at MS University, Baroda, and the other with Pro Professor Kaustav Sanyal at Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Jakur, Bengaluru. He has she has received research grants from various schemes from Science and Engineering Research Board, Science, Department of Science and Technology, and Department of Biotechnology. She has presented her research at various national and international conferences. She has published 17 research articles in international peer-reviewed journals, which have been cited more than 450 times, one book chapter, and invited recommendation articles. She also serves as an associate editor of Bioprotocol Journal and has reviewed several research articles submitted to high-impact journals like Nature, Science, PNAS, etc. Her interests lie in understanding the changes in molecular events that occur during plant pathology interactions. She studies the role of plant immunity and pathogen virulence mechanism using genetic editing tools, omic methods, and high-resolution microscopy. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Shweta. May I request our chairman, sir, to formally welcome Dr. Shweta to this gathering. Thank you, sir. It is my privilege to introduce our third dignitary of the day, Dr. Karthik Shastri. Dr. Shastri is working as an assistant professor at RV College of Engineering, Bengaluru, India, where he teaches calculus and non-calculus based engineering physics courses. He has a strong educational background, including PhD in applied physics from University of Texas, Arlington. 
He is involved in various student enrichment activities by serving as a faculty advisor and mentor for the Astrophysics Club and has been initiating student-based research and development programs. He has also participated in various faculty development programs and workshops related to teaching methodologies. Currently, he is part of pilot teaching program at RV College of Engineering that emphasizes boosting stu active student participation in classroom through the use of ICT tools, peer-based learning and use of student projects. Prior to his stint in teaching, Dr. Shastri was involved in developing a novel time of flight spectrometer used to probe the surface of graphene through low energy positrons. He was also part of research team that worked at National Synchrotron Light Source, that is NSLS-1, at Brookhaven National Labs, New York. He has also written proposals for SERB, DST, DOE, and ARPAE projects. Dr. Shastri has published his in reputed peer-based journals like Nature, Physics Review, etc. on topics such as position spectroscopy, corrosion behavior, and electron emissions. Overall, Dr. Shastri has a strong academic and research background, as well as extensive teaching and mentoring experience. He has made significant contributions to the field of applied physics and continues to be actively involved in research and education. Dr. Shastri, we are honored to have you amidst us today. May I request Principal Dr. Sita Shankar to welcome Dr. Shastri to this gathering. Thank you, ma'am. Our final guest for the day, Mr. Nitin Shastri, Director, Enterprise Content Technology, London Stock Exchange Group. Dr. Nitin Shastri is a senior software professional with over two and a half decades of work experience in the corporate world. In London Stock Exchange, Mr. Nitin manages teams of software developers that supports one of the world's top financial infrastructure that helps most of the financial professionals across the world. Prior to LSCG, he has worked for companies like Hewlett Packard, Compaq, Digital Equipment Corporation, Thomas Reuters, and more. Working for some of the top companies has enabled him to work in different domains like content technology, risk technology, wealth management, e-commerce, and a lot more. While software development has been his forte, Mr. Nitin has been active in the area of education as well. Mr. Nitin has come out with a mobile app called Audiocation, where language textbooks in audio can be found. Currently, they are available in five different languages, Kannada, Hindi, Sanskrit, Urdu, and English, in which the audio textbooks can be found in education for students between grade eight to 12. Over 7,000 students have been benefited from this, and the best part of it all is that it is given away for free. With a view of sharing the best practices of software industry to others, Mr. Nitin has been consulting some of the farmers, cooperative societies, and FPOs, pharma pro producer organizations, to bring about positive changes in the way agri-tech can be used in processing the farm produce for better result to the farmers. The work with farmers is a carry forward of the work that Mr. Nitin has done by being a part of Argium, an NGO in water and sanitation, sanitation sector. From education point of view, it, he has done BE in computer science from Chikabalapur, Bangalore University and MBA from University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. A cordial welcome to you, Mr. Shastri. Uh, may I request our principal, Dr. Sita Shankar, to do the honors. Dear audience, let us once again put our hands together to extend a heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to all our dignitaries for joining us today to be a part of today's event. I would like to welcome our principal, Dr. Sita Shankar, for enthusiastically leading us from the front and guiding our students towards the participation of today's event. A warm welcome to you, ma'am. Thank you. 
I would like to welcome our parents who have joined us today for always supporting us in all our endeavors. Hearty welcome to all the parents who have gathered here today. A warm welcome to all the faculty members of Whitefield Global School for being a part of today's event. It is you who are the driving force and backbone of events at this magnitude. A warm welcome to all of you. To my dearest students, as I welcome you and wish you the best for your presentation today, I would like you to remember, don't wait for an opportunity. Go out and create it. Beware also that there is opportunity in adversity. Every problem is a potential opportunity for you to create solution that will add value to you and to others. What opportunities are available for you to be utilized today? Think about it. God bless children. Good luck to you always. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, ma'am. No event is complete without the enlightening narratives of our director academics, Dr. Sharada Chandrasekharan. She was not able to make it to the event. However, she has sent her wishes through a video message. Respected Chairman, sir, invited guests, parents, teachers, and darling students, a very warm good morning to all of you. And uh, I regret being not there physically today, but I know that today of taking a big leap into the world of research, I would like to congratulate the principal, Dr. Sita, and her team for starting this event in our school. I'm extremely proud of them. I'm indeed uh, very honored to address you on this topic. But before that, I would like to tell a small story. It seems there was an old man. Every day he used to sit under a tree and meditate. His grandson used to ask him, what are you doing after the meditation? Then he used to say that I am feeding the wolf. Every day this went on. So the grandson became very curious, where is the wolf? So he told, I believe there are two wolves inside me. One wolf want to be angry and shout, bite. The other wolf wants to be peaceful. So I'm feeding the wolf. So he said, I believe, which wolf are you feeding? He said, I have taken a, a wolf which seeks peace. And you decide which wolf you want to feed. My question to all of you is, every one of us have got multiple wolves in us. So which wolf are we feeding? Are we feeding the wolf which gives us knowledge? Are we feeding the wolf which gives us a very instant result? Are we feeding the wolf which makes us uh, our life and our entire learning journey stronger? It's all in our hands. Because when I look into the whole lot of learning session today, many children are confused what is best, what, where to go. Everybody is thrilled with the word research, but they do not know what exactly is research. They do not know how much of trials we have to do, how much of trial and errors will, will happen, and how to take the entire data into analyticals, and how to analyze the data to get the result. And many a time the result may not be good. Then how to go back? So this is a long journey. This, not, this will not give us an instant result. In such cases, how not to lose the patience. This also helps a lot. And this is also for all those people who think that a tutorial can replace a school. A tutorial may give you an instant result, but it will not give you a learning for life. A tutorial may give you just a small path, but a, tu a tutorial will not make the child learn for life. It is a school which can take a child into this learning journey. And if a child is attentive in the class, then the child learns everything. So this is what I wanted to tell you. I wish all of you all the best and success. I want all of you to get into this journey of research. And in many more years to come, you will be taking this path forever. And you will be remembering this alma mater of yours, which has laid 
the first stone into the field of research. I thank all the judges for accepting the invitation, for being here and for guiding our darling students. And once again, I'm extremely thankful to our chairman whose brainchild and whose vision is to turn the school into a research center. And sir, today we have laid the foundation. I regret not being here, but I hope that we are going to go in this journey a long way. And I once again congratulate the principal whose brainchild is this entire event. Congratulations, Sita, and all of you, all the best, and may the best team win. In my view, all of you are winners because you have taken the first step into this learning journey. Congratulations and all the best to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, ever-inspiring words, ma'am. I would like to call our principal, Dr. Sita Shankar, to address the gathering. Thank you, children. Respected chairman, sir, esteemed judges, vice principal, coordinators, quality heads, teachers, parents, and students. I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to Samhita Navachara, a humble endeavor to develop research spirit in our students. Frank Will D. Roosevelt once said, if you cannot prepare the future for your children, prepare your children for the future. And this is our endeavor to prepare our students, our children for the future. What the future holds, nobody knows. Right now, in the next 10 years, 20 years, many of the jobs are going to go obsolete. With the today's, in the day and age of chat GPT and AI assistance, we really don't know how many jobs are going to be there and how many are not going to be there. So how do we prepare our students to face tomorrow's world? The one of the things that we at Whitefield Global School do is to inculcate 21st century skills in our students, which will enable them to become competent in whatever the environment may be 20 years from today. And what are those skills we are looking at? Problem solving, critical thinking, public speaking, creativity, innovation, and empathy. And this endeavor today that we have our IDP symposium is to inculcate these habits in our students. This thing that we are doing today, this event today, will help us bridge the gap between schools and higher education, schools and industries. We have erudite judges here who have been a part of the industry, who have been part of educational institutions, who can guide our children, give them the right pointers to shape themselves and be college ready and uh, industry ready. Many parents come to us and tell us that, ma'am, where does the student have to concentrate? Should he concentrate on um, preparing for the tutorial, coaching center, or should he prepare for the school? I have like, Sharada ma'am just spoke to us. I have only one answer to parents that we prepare the student for life. Coaching center may take you to your desired college, but schools prepare you for the college, prepare you for life. If a lack of students get into a college, what makes students stand out is the way they are groomed, the way they speak, the way their confidence levels, what they have done in school speaks a lot for students who plan to go abroad for foreign education or pursue research. And this platform is for all our students who want to learn, who want to grow, and who want to present their research findings. Like Sharda ma'am just said, research has become a very, very loosely used term. Anybody doing anything, they say it is research. So this endeavor of ours, this effort of ours is to bring originality into work that is being done. We want our children to produce original and genuine work that would be looked at by all the people around the world and being published in journals where they can very proudly say that in high school they have published a paper in journal. And this is the vision of our founder, our chairman, Dr. C. Purna Chandra Rao to develop an innovation cell in school. And this is the starting point for that innovation. So let us hope that today is a learning day for all of us, irrespective of student, teacher, or parent. We are all going to go enriched 
from today's event. Thank you for being here and uh, wishing all the participants all the best. Participation is the key. All of you have already won. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. With this, let us direct our attention to the core objective that has united us here today. I kindly request the students from the Commerce and Humanities section to remain in the auditorium. Those from the Physical Science and AI sections are requested to proceed to the music room and biology and psychology participants are requested to convene in the dance room. Before we proceed, I would like to welcome our reverend judges who would be judging the students of Physical Science and AI group with their expertise. We have Dr. Karthik Shastri and Mr. Amit Gupta as the judges for this section. Please give them a big round of applause. Let us begin with our presentations now. We have a single mission to protect and hand on this planet to the next generation. In this modern era, we're faced with grave obstacles of high levels of carbon emissions. And our friends are here to address this problem. I invite Srinayan, Vibha, Nareen and Sangeeta to take over. So, good morning to our respected dignitaries, parents, fellow students, teachers and dear friends. To begin with, I would like to share some history. The world's first patent for an automobile was made back in 1886 by Carl Benz. Since then, it has been 137 years of continuous improvements in the automobile industry. Over the course of this time, one factor has remained constant, and that is the fuel used to run our engines. The fuel that I'm talking about are fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a great way to run our engines, but they are by and by far actually one of the worst. In the past 50 years, humans have emitted over 500 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. So while our internal combustion engines uh, played a key part in human history, it is time for them to go home. The key problems that we would like to address are fuel and power inefficiency, high carbon emissions and dependence on fossil fuels. A new and innovative way to tackle these problems is by using nano-catalyzed fuel cells. If you don't know what this means, here's a short description. So let's see what's a, what a fuel cell is. A fuel cell is a stack of mini electrolytic converters that generate energy and aim to address environmental problems posed by the usage of fossil fuels. Follows the process of electrolysis to generate energy from hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So There are many types of fuel cells such as alkaline fuel cells, phosphoric acid cells and PEM cells. It stands for proton exchange method. To aid in this process of energy generation, we use nanocatalysis, which is the process where nanostructures are added into a chemical reaction to increase their efficiency. Going in depth, a hydrogen fuel cell requires two key components. One is the chemical fuel, that is hydrogen, and oxidizing agent, that is oxygen. Through the process of electrolysis, the movement of hydrogen ions causes the movements of electrons in the opposite direction that creates a direct current. This is achieved by using a catalyst. The catalyst then forces the hydrogen ions, hydrogen to undergo oxidation and the hydrogen ions thus produced are used for energy production. In our project, we look at the use of nanotechnology as a catalyst in fuel cells and how this highly efficient and clean process can be used to power our vehicles. The nano catalyst that we will be focusing on is the platinum cobalt catalyst. This catalyst combines high power efficiency at a relatively lower cost when we compare it to the pure platinum catalyst. As we know and as is evident, the size of a nano catalyst is extremely small, ranging from just one nanometer to a few hundred nanometers. This substantially reduces the quantity of the nano catalyst that we would require. To harness the power of hydrogen, we need to find renewable and sustainable ways to source it. Uh, green hydrogen is hydrogen that has been produced without the usage of fossil fuels in places such as biogas plants. Biogas plants use animal fecal matter to create biogas, which can then be processed into pure biomethane, which is a source gas for the synthesis of hydrogen. 
A fuel cell is an energy conversion device that converts the chemical energy of a fuel to electric energy without any uh, intermediate process. There are certain conditions to maintain in order to get the maximum power out of a fuel cell. The optimal temperature range for a fuel cell is 60 to 90 degrees Celsius. This is when the fuel cell is running. To maintain this temperature, we can use various coolants. The best catalyst to use for this process belongs to the platinum group of metals. This is because they possess the highest catalytic properties while also showing excellent resistance to corrosion. But as we know, platinum is very expensive and extremely rare to find. Thus, we look at cheaper yet just as efficient alternatives to platinum, namely cobalt and nickel for this process. So now let us talk about a practical application of a fuel cells. Oh, one of the most common cars that you'd see on our Indian roads driven by cab drivers is the Toyota Etios. According to the Toyota's manufacturing details, it produces a base power output of 88.73 horsepower. This, when converted into watts, is 66 kilowatt, which is the energy output of the petrol variant of the Etios. Now, when we swap the combustion engine with a fuel cell, the energy output dramatically increases from 66 kilowatt to 164 kilowatt. 164 kilowatts when converted back into horsepower is 221. This is 20 more horsepower than what is produced by a Mercedes C-Class sedan which costs around 56 lakhs. Hence, we can see that the power efficiency of a fuel cell is far greater than that of an internal combustion engine. Talking about the refueling process in fuel cell engine, it involves the following five steps. First, the fuel cell vehicle enters the refueling station and powers off. The hatch opens and the first nozzle is in uh, the hydrogen nozzle is inserted to the first valve that is open. After an airtight seal has been created, the hydrogen starts flowing into the tank. After the uh, hydrogen is completely filled, the valve closes and the nozzle is removed and the hatch closes. So when the onboard system in the vehicle senses that the hydrogen in the fuel tank is running low, it notifies the driver. The driver is then expected to drive to the nearest hydrogen refueling system. Upon reaching the station, the driver gets to choose the amount of hydrogen he would like to refill. The refill assistant then opens the refuel hatch and inserts the refueling nozzle. This opens the first valve involved in the process. The refueling nozzle then creates an airtight and secure seal and the second valve involved in the process opens. This valve enables the hydrogen to flow into the tank. This two valve system is necessary to ensure that it is safe and to reduce the chance of a hydrogen leak. In our process, the hydrogen loss is very minimal. An important question that you might have is, is roadside assistance possible? Considering the very unique maintenance property of fuel cell vehicles, there are certain limitations. In case the fuel cell stacks runs out due to any reason, we'll have to take it to a workshop where it will be open and examined. This is not possible on the roadside. Fuel cell trucks have less problems as compared to a fuel cell car as it is developed in such a way that it withstands various environmental factors. Fuel cell train does not have such a requirement. With the ever-increasing requirement for energy in today's world, many people doubt the longevity of a nanocatalyst in a fuel cell. Nanocatalysts do not run out, however, they undergo aging. Uh, a non-used nanocatalyst has a single particle diameter of not more than 2 to 3 nanometer, but during the process of usage, they undergo mainly two phenomena. The first being particle coalescence, where two smaller particles clump together to form a bigger particle, and uh, Oswald ripening wherein one particle dissolves and redistributes into other particles, thus making them bigger. In the case of nanocatalysts, the smaller the size of the particle, the larger the surface area to volume ratio is. The larger the ratio is, the more easier the catalyzation to take place. However, Oswald ripening and particle coalescence can degrade the quality of these nan nanocatalysts that reduces its quality and its Powers. Unfortunately, the widespread use of nanocatalyzed hydrogen-based fuel cells 
So personal vehicular use is not yet out there, mainly because of three reasons. Lack of funding, lack of infrastructure and lack of readily available hydrogen. But with current technology, these issues are resolvable. Yet this is not in practice due to the advancement in electric vehicles. It is more feasible to use an electric car than to use a car running on hydrogen based fuel cells. So you may be asking how we can make a difference in altering our carbon footprint if we can't add fuel cells to our passenger vehicles. Well, the answer to that question is straightforward. Since our cars are already transitioning to electric vehicles, instead of meddling with that process, how about we add fuel cells in vehicles where adding electric batteries is not really feasible. The vehicles that I'm talking about are our commercial transport vehicles, such as our cargo trucks and cargo trains. Adding uh, fuel cells in such vehicles is far cheaper than adding electric batteries and also improves the longevity of such vehicles. Based on our research, we have found out that by using fuel cell in trains, it can go for a longer range of 1600 kilometers for every 30 minutes of review. This means that we will be able to save 12,800 12, liters of diesel per train for the same distance. But what about the ongoing process of electrification of our railways, you may ask. Isn't that more efficient? The answer is yes. But we need to look at where this electricity is being generated from. This electricity itself is generated in power plants based out of coal. That again brings us back to the usage of fossil fuels. Instead, this electricity could be generated in power plants based out of fuel cells, thereby enabling us to produce clean and green electricity for our trains. For transport trucks, we can get more than 1000 kilometers on a single review, which takes less than 15 minutes. So, our findings are that, though the initial cost of adoption of this technology is very high, it quickly repays itself over time, as it is the cleanest form of energy and is made more efficient by the usage of nanotechnology. Our transport sector accounts for 50% of the total oil consumption and 19% of, uh, of the total uh, energy consumption of the country. Thus, by changing just a sector, you will not only help make a big impact by improving the economy of the country, but will also help improve the cleanliness of the environment. But incentives and subsidies provided by the government in future years will help improve the quality of research and will also make the adoption of this technology very quick. But what good can this technology be if its lifespan is not satisfactory? According to the current details provided by numerous manufacturers, the current lifespan of our fuel cell is on par, if not better, than the current combustion engines. Our preliminary findings show that if you are scaling these up to cargo trucks and transport trains, we have a longer lifespan of maybe one to two years more than normal combustion engines. However, we must keep some details in mind uh, that are the sources of degradation for fuel cells that may include but is not limited to mechanical wear and tear, thermal degradation and chemical degradation. Now, that brings us to another question. What do we do with a fuel cell once its lifespan is over? An essential part of using a fuel cell is its disposal method after its use. One idea we have come up with is to sort, is to uh, disassemble the fuel cell into components and firstly remove any remaining electrolytic solution from the fuel cell. Now, these uh, components can be sorted into different categories based on their reusability and other criteria. Any materials like metals can be reused based on certain factors while hazardous material can be treated or disposed according to regulations. Now, on that note, let's talk about some future ideas that we can implement for fuel cells to make them practical. Number one, the development of switch and go fuel cells. Using switch and go fuel cells would allow uh, quality professionals to provide it clear roadside assistance by being able to remove the fuel cell on the spot and replace it with a new one. Number two, implementation of nano catalyst collectors. As we have said before, nanocatalysts age and to uh, improve the replacement process, why not develop collectors that are inside the fuel cell that would allow the old nanocatalyst to be collected. This would make the replacement process easier and more efficient. And last but not the least, uh, the usage of the water generated from elect electrolysis for the produ production of more hydrogen. This would improve the range of the vehicle and would remove our dependence on hydrogen refueling stations by a large amount. And with that, um, thank you everyone for listening and have a great day. Any, any questions?
Yes, yes. So, in the Hindenburg disaster, um, 24 people died due to an unfortunate explosion that was caused uh, due to hydrogen uh, exploding. However, we have done our research because uh, we understand that hydrogen is a dangerous fuel. However, in the Hindenburg explosion, there were various other factors, such as the fact that the outside of the airship was coated with an aluminium particle, which would make oxidation far easier. And there was another chemical, which I, I forgot, I'm really sorry, really sorry, but this uh, made sure that the hydrogen inside exploded at a very violent rate. One more thing I'd like to note is, out of the 24 people that died that day, 23 of them jumped out of the hydrogen, uh, out of the Hindenburg. Yes, uh, according to the details, the hydrogen exploded, but upwards, in the upward direction, everybody at the time, Uh, see, what we did for this comparison is we took the base output, as we said, converted into watts. Now, based on the uh, information provided by the U.S. Department of Energy, we took an estimate of 50% efficiency for a fuel cell. Uh, that's why we said that we focus only on transport trucks and uh, What's the point of transport? Uh, well, as we said about the air conditioning, one more idea that I just thought of is the heat generated in this process, we could use that actually for air conditioning. So, yeah, uh, we could use the heat generated in this process for the air conditioning. Yes, I agree that. Uh, okay, now. Rule number one. See, please take this positively to any student yeah. who is here. When you are presenting, you are the director of your script. Everyone over here don't know what you are going to speak. And secondly, if you don't know the answer, say I don't. All right. Don't say we are going to use the heat from the truck to uh, use it for air conditioning. This is reverse thermodynamics. How will you take heat and convert it? How, how will you, so if I'm taking heat from some other body, I will get hot. So how are you going to cool it? Is that making sense? Right? So 
it's a learning curve. So don't take this in the negative sense that you know I'm critiquing, but as, as a judge, it's my job to critique. So the first thing is, I like the way how you guys presented, and um, try to keep the try to reduce the size of the paper as much as possible. Because it's okay, you make a mistake, it's okay. Even when I put teach in a class, I make mistakes. But then have the confidence to come out of it. In fact, you had a list in the middle when you were talking about electrolysis. It's my good on you that you did it. Don't think that you have to say every word as it goes. Let it come out naturally. Own the script. Got it? So uh, these are the overall comments I have. Uh, you have done a good research. Um, but you need to go a little bit further. Um, try to keep it as basic as possible because you know basic chemistry. You know how your fuel uh, cell works. Now what you have to do is calculate the efficiency. Uh, I think they have taught you first law of thermodynamics, right? You know what's a Carnot syndrome? Reversible, irreversible cycle. That is the fundamental principle. If you know what's Carnot's engine, you will exactly know how any combustible engine works. There is still a fundamental reason why we are sticking to com uh, combustible. Your solar cell has 20%, maximum 40% efficiency. Your combustible engine comes up to 60% efficiency. We still not have uh, come up with the ultimate combustible engine. Your hydrogen fuel cell is at 15%. There's a long way to catch up, and economics also plays a very crucial role. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Group 3 from Class 11 and we have taken up the proper statement, the study of AI in setbacks and solutions. So as we know, AI has become a new buzzword around the world these days, hasn't it? And we have been hearing this term quite often now. But what exactly is AI? In simple terms, I think AI can be explained as the machine's ability to mimic human intelligence or more, pro or more precisely enhance it. Now, AI can work faster and process more data Genius is sitting working. And that's crazy, which is why AI is such a big uh, is such a big hype these days. The recommendation systems on your social media pages, on your shopping websites, as well as the facial recognition systems on your mobile phones, the GPS technology used on Google Maps, Twitter, so Snapchat, and other such apps, all of these are operated by AI. When the industry first thought of automation, the developers had an idea. What if the machine could learn? Well, what is machine learning? We should know that before we talk about AI. Machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence and computer science, which focuses on using data and algorithms to teach the machines, gradually improving its accuracy. It's like teaching a baby how to work and how it gets better at it. The types of machine learning a supervised, semi-supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Now deep learning. So it is a type of machine learning technique which is based on learning by example, something which comes to human beings naturally. It has neural networks, which is similar to how the human brain has neural networks. Now the types of deep learning are multilayer perceptron, convolutional neural network, and recurrent neural network. About the types of AI, on the basis of its capabilities, it can be classified as narrow AI, general AI, and super AI. And on the basis of its functionality, it can be classified as reactive machines, limited memory machines, theory of mind, and self aware AI. AI is interdisciplinary, which means that it involves skills and learnings of several other subjects that we have been learning from our school days, starting with maths. AI relies heavily on mathematical concepts such as linear algebra, probability theory, calculus, and statistics to be able to represent and understand data. Now, the next, so the next subject that we come to is computer science. As we know it, AI is a subdiscipline of computer science itself. Since it involves computer science concepts such as computational thinking, and logistics and um, algorithms, it is deeply rooted in computer science. 
Now we take we come to linguistics. This must be a new term for you all. Well, I'll explain it to you. The NLP, that is natural the natural language processing, is a crucial aspect of AI, which helps in transforming spoken words to text, and then finally to a word which the computer understands. Now, as an aspiring engineer, I would like to talk about my favorite subject, physics. Physics deals with the understanding of fundamental laws and principles. AI is not generally reliant on uh, physics, but it, its applications can be used in um, finding out discoveries when it comes to physics. For example, the most significant discovery in physics, that is the discovery of the Higgs boson particle, was made using the um, using the AI neural networks, which were which were being used to study the particle collisions. So, cognitive science and psychology. The first thing which comes in our mind is what is cognitive science. Now, cognitive science is a program that integrates the study of AI with the human cognition. And when we combine it with psychology, it gives us data about how humans understand and perceive this world. Now, we can use this data to create such an AI which can understand the functioning of the human brain. Now, isn't that magnificent? Moving forward to neuroscience, neuroscience is a it, it, it's a study of the human brain and its functioning. Now the researchers use the data obtained from neuroscience to create an AI which can mimic the functioning of the human brain. And when we combine the data obtained from neuroscience, cognitive science, and psychology, we can create such an AI which can understand and even also mimic the emotions of the human beings and that would be a massive achievement in the history of the human kind. Now let us look at some of the advances in AI. The first advantage is reduction in human error. Machines don't make mistakes even while carrying our life tasks like us human beings. The next thing is reducing cost. It is a long term investment. You don't need to invest again uh, like once and again. The next thing is that it's available 24 7. It does not need rest or it does not need politics. It can work anytime. It helps in repetitive jobs. You have lots of data to compute, you have lots of information to deal with. AI can do it efficiently. Next is digital assistance. A lot of services today are provided online by various industries like banking, hospitals, etc. So AI helps to make the entire website layout better for people. Next is faster decisions. It can do complex calculations and take faster decisions in microseconds with 100% accuracy. Next is daily applications. We use AI on our phones to even do simple tasks like setting alarms, reminders, etc. Next is new inventions. Natural language processor, virtual agents, biometrics, all of these came into use because of AI. The last thing is customer, improving customer experience, which is related to digital assistance. Now, improving customer uh, experience in, in the websites and all, all of those can be provided online and it is also personalized because of AI. Uh, so, so, let's come to the main part of our uh, today's project, the research. It is, is it AI dangerous? See, AI has multiple disadvantages, but there are many ways to solve them. So now first, um, the major uh, problem over here is cost. Um, over here I'm talking about commercial AI. Uh, so commercial AI is pretty expensive. It's, it, it's, it's quite expensive and it's uh, not something you can market. It's not a market that you can market. So over here, uh, the main solution for this, for this problem is to identify the right type of technology and partner with it. Now, um, so I'll give a real life example. We have to we have to make food for a seven year old child. Now we have two options. We can buy normal table salt or pink salt. Now pink salt is much ex more expensive and has more health benefits. But table salt over here is not expensive and may not have much health benefits as pink salt. Right? But now we need to focus on the fact that we are feeding a seven year old child who doesn't need much health um, health you know, health ben uh, benefits. So a normal table salt will also work wonders for it. It's not like you're feeding an old, like old, uh, old age man. Uh, so yeah. So similarly, in AI terms, we have two types of AI. I mean, two. Yeah. ChatGPT 3.5 and ChatGPT 4.5. Uh, 
4.0. Now 4.0 is 30 times more costlier than 3.5 and it's and if our needs can be satisfied by 3.5, I personally feel it's illogical and foolish to, uh, to use 4.0 which is much more expensive than 3.5. And the other thing is um, by cooperating with institutions. Now for example, let me know, let's take a real life example again. What is how? Now Google, when we think about Google, it is a pioneer of AI. Google has started AI. But similar, like, so once AI started, Microsoft has collaborated with OpenAI and started and like integrated their AIs together. Like their products with AI. Similarly, Google made its own AI, but that, that gave AI you know, that gave Microsoft a head start. Now, Google's Vertex and uh, Bard now is still catching up to Microsoft's products. Uh, so that is one other way that Microsoft has reduced its cost. Now, unemployment, as Dr. Sita Ma'am had mentioned earlier, unemployment uh, is one of the major factors in today's world. Now, let me say that AI would not destroy and create jobs, it will transform the pre-existing jobs today. Now, let's jump back in time. 50 years back, people had the same assumption about computer science. They believed that their jobs would get destroyed and computer, computers would take over them. But now we know that's not true. The IT field is one of the biggest and the leading industries in the world, providing, almost, providing jobs to 3.12 million people in India. So I'm pretty sure that AI will also do the same. Give it time, it will happen. Now there are some many, many jobs that it will bring. Now, for example, we have data scientists and AI analysts. We have AI ethicists, policy experts, system integrators, trainers, cybersecurity experts, and UX designers. Now these people are these professions are people who will optimize uh, AI AI models and programs. And now since AI is being increased, like the um, ethic, ethicity of like AI is becoming a major concern in like future right now. So what we can, uh, so these these people, are, these policies made by these professionals are going to may be guidelines for uh, tomorrow's AI, AI models. Now AI system integrators, like I said, Microsoft had integrated OpenAI's ChatGPT with its products, right? Now these are the people who will integrate these two products UX designers are employees or like professionals that will make AI a more um, uh, customer friendly, uh, more customer friendly and more um, uh, comfortable uh, to approach to. Cyber security. So cyber security again, AI's uh, AI's threat is one of the major concerns in the world. Now these uh, they are they're able to hack and you know capture right now capture won't work anymore since AI can actually figure that out too. So these professionals are the ones that will like. Um, yeah, will specialize in identifying and mitigating potential risks and vulnerabilities associated with AI. Now AI trainers, it's pretty basic. Now, what are the, uh, so these are like these these professionals will bridge the gap between AI models and the um, AI model and the customer end by like uh, by providing guidelines and uh, helping the customers to use or like the end users to uh, to make their uh, work life more easier. Right? So there are a lot of ethical problems in AI today, such as hacking biases. So to prevent this, we can use systems such as guardrails to uh, prevent hacking and to make it safe, safe, uh, safe consumer more safe from such uh, uh, dangerous, um, dangerous things. Next, we have degradation. Degradation is uh, degradation does not happen in AI, but the software does lag in AI. So. The further we go in um, time, such as Chat GPT, which was last updated in 2021, will be much less user friendly and much less efficient than something such as Plot. Because Plot will have has much more frequent updates than Chat GPT and is more user friendly and has better answers than Chat GPT. Next, we have 
technological dependence. Technological dependence is a huge problem in today's society. We are mostly connected to our so, uh, to phones or to any device most of the time. To, an average human uses about two to three hours of AI almost every day. To prevent this, we can set our limits on our phone to uh, stop the, uh, to maintain better uh, to maintain our body better and um, help arm and reduce mental stress. Next. Next, we have data gathering and storage. Today, a lot of companies need a lot of data and storage to process what they have to tell. And the same is for AI. AI requires a lot of storage to give efficient answers. So, if we have a small data pool such as ChatGPT, it will give very um, basic answers and won't explain to the point. But if we have a better data storage system, we can exp the answers come out much better and efficient which will help us to do further, will help us to get better results in our, in our answers. Thank you. So this is just a brief of whatever we have seen in the presentation so far. The first thing is that AI is the most disruptive technology. No one could have thought that a machine can learn, a machine can be trained and a machine can become independent. Next thing is that the field is inherently indisciplinary and it is connected to a lot of sectors. It can be related with a lot of subjects and it can be used in numerous fields for the development of those fields and development of AI itself. The next thing is AI can be grouped on basis of capability and on the basis of functionality. And finally, when we have so many advantages of using AI, there are also disadvantages which need to be taken care of properly and we must make sure that we can reduce the risk of whatever uh, disadvantages can happen by, solving, by finding solutions. So these are the sources which we use and we missed one, which is the most important, our parents. Without their guidelines, we would never come this far. And this is the link for our research paper. As the topic was AI, uh, have you guys come across what is considered as the definition of AI? Like, what do you call AI? Basically, a machine's ability to be able to process information the way we humans do with each other, like uh, the way we have neural connections in the brain, the same way a machine has the capability to form neural connections and process data. Machine has the ability to what? To form connections and then analyze oh, it. Don't say neural. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, because neural is one of the, the way to achieve it. Uh, have you heard, uh, have you come across the term called as a Turing test? No. Do you know who is Alan Turing? How many of you have watched that movie? Uh, Benedict, Imitation Game. How many of you have watched it? What is Imitation yeah. Game, the whole movie based? He's the father. Alan Turing is the father of AI, machine learning and AI. He's is kind of the uh, the starter of the this and the Turing test is basically about imagine that you're interacting with some agent, and his proposal was that if you if you as a human you are interacting with a machine, and you cannot distinguish whether you are talking or you are interacting with a machine, or it could be a human on the other side. If you at the other end of it, you don't know whether at the back of it is a machine or a real human. And you cannot you cannot simply do it whether it was a real machine or not. That's the one that uh, is considered as a definition of uh, and uh, I think uh, in terms of the machine learning and all that, and that's what uh, a lot of uh, the material in both paper is coming through that. And uh, that's where it's a, one of the in terms of what was thought as the processes or the jobs that the machine would be able to automate and are at risk, which happens to be repetitive jobs and the things, a bit of decision making and all that that you do, uh, what has turned out in the last few years is quite an opposite. What you see is systems like ChatGPT, 
which is again based on uh, a new technology or a new type of networks or the model which is called as a large language model. It's not a general, it's not a specific machine, but it's a more general language model. That seems to be doing a lot of things. Uh, but to, to everyone's surprise and nobody really understands it that well, that uh, what has happened is that machines ability to do a lot of things which we call as creative. So you've seen uh, things like Midjourney or Dali, which you can give a text prompt, say that, you know, draw this, uh, or, uh, you know, I want to have this dog which is in a car. And it would do that. Uh, even the chat GPT, when you are asking a question, it is answering that in much like a natural form, which is all the creative kind of space. It's very surprising that those are the areas where it is disrupting the things. So, like the, the entire things have been turned on its head in terms of the predictions and all that. Yeah, the other thing is uh, AI is based on physics, especially quantum physics. In fact, uh, the next technology that we have is called as quantum computing. And yes, so AI is all about quantum computing. The idea is very simple. Uh, how can you transmit more amount of data in a short time? And how can you, and when you say computing, imagine the best AI we have right now is our own human body. Right? It doesn't take you a fraction of a second if you're touching something hot, touching something cold, you smell something good, bad. Right now, just you standing there. There are so many systems at work. Your ears are listening, your eyes are focused, you're breathing, you're standing on your foot. There are so many things that work on auto function. This is AI. And the other important thing about AI is there is a very important term here called as learning. So AI is going to learn what you teach. So if you teach an AI to lie, it will lie. If you teach an AI to be honest, so to be honest, that's why you have someone called as an ethics, ethics guy over there. What do you mean by AI ethics? Exactly the point. Exactly the point. If I am a if I am a hacker and I teach my AI to hack systems, I am doing something wrong. It will not know. AI will not know. AI is doing its job. It is doing what I asked it to do. Right? That is the one. The uh, other thing is, whenever you make a presentation, please do not put paragraphs. All right. Uh, the point of a presentation is to create that visual appeal, and the points or the bullets that you put in your presentation has to be a reminder to you. That's why we do a presentation, so you don't carry a paper. Say so anytime you have a doubt, you can look at the screen. You can take a second, you can swallow your saliva, you can say, okay, so this is what is going to happen. So the moment you have a pointer there, that pointer should give you the idea as to what is the next point you are transitioning into. It's okay if you take um, a, a, a couple of seconds extra in between your presentation. But always make sure that the moment you put more data onto your slide, nobody is listening to you, everyone is reading the slide. So you become redundant. The focus is you, that is just a visual appeal. So it's like a rock star who's entering, the fireworks behind it is to create that awe effect, right? If you make the fireworks too brilliant, nobody's going to focus on the rock star. Please keep that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So a very good morning to honorable judges and participants and parents. So our topic is climate change and our primary problem statement is the substance of urban cities due to the excessive extraction of groundwater. 
Through our solution of floor cities, we aim at solving three major problems. One, contamination of water bodies due to the release of industrial toxic waste. Number two, prevention of the subsidence of urban cities. And number three, restoration of the groundwater level. So what do you see when you look at this picture? Flood? But does it really look like the water is rushing down? No, it looks more like the water level is rising up. And this is where our problem statement revolves around. So our topic is subsidence of soil above groundwater level. Overuse of groundwater has led to a new problem, land subsidence, which not only threatens uh, the damage to this infrastructure and buildings, but also threatens livelihood of millions of now, when we remove water from the underground aquifers, the soil began to compact and sink. Now, this can happen gradually over the years or just in few hours. In either case, the effects are long-lasting and really expensive to them. Now, we also see this happening in Jakarta. The Indonesian city is said to be sinking 6.7 inches per year just because of excessive uh, pumping of groundwater. In India too, Haryana and Punjab use uh, about 85% of the available groundwater and Chennai and Mumbai are actually sinking because of excessive pumping of water. So our solution not only focuses on the subsidence of cities but also the harmful effects of wastewater on marine life. So we put our main focus on five points, bioaccumulation, thermal pollution, harmful mutations, murkiness of water and low concentration of dissolved oxygen. So bioaccumulation is uh, where the harmful, like the harmful materials which are released from the industrial water uh, start to set, settle on the tissues of marine organisms and which slowly uh, makes it important it slowly makes it difficult for them to perform their like, day-to-day functions and they eventually die. Thermal pollution is where hot or cold water is like directly released into the water bodies and the sudden te uh, temperature fluctuation affects marine. Harmful mutations. The harmful chemicals which are found in the industrial wastewater, with, uh, wastewater sometimes cause mutations and uh, lead to formation of new diseases. Uh, murkiness of water. When wastewater is released into uh, water bodies without being actually treated, uh, it causes murkiness of water and it thus doesn't allow proper percolation of sunlight into the water and the marine life will find it difficult to perform day-to-day -day functions and this will result in lowering of concentration of dissolved oxygen. Thus, it is essential that we treat wastewater before we actually release it into the water body. Subsidence of cities and water scarcity plays an immense impact on the minds of the citizens. The first thing is the water price rises due to water scarcity and the cities, citizens who experience financial instability can experience insomnia and citizens who are below the poverty line can, can go through suicide. Since due to the subsidence of cities, the living quality decreases, this causes the citizens to migrate. Because of migration, the citizens can feel a feeling of exclusion, alienation and distress since they have a lack of autonomy over their lives. Their social status decreases and disturbances are seen in the lives of children. It also creates a negative opinion on the government since they cannot provide an immediate solution. Use which is 9%, industrial use 2%, and the 50% of the urban water requirements are also fulfilled by groundwater. The average stage of groundwater extraction in the entire country as a whole for example, is about 60 percent Another 
Till now you have seen the problem that we came through. Now we have a solution for it. We have a pictorial explanation of our model. Here the industrial waste water goes through flows through the water treatment plant and gets recycled. The, a small pond is uh, made with permeable paving base is created so that the water from the recycled water, uh, water treatment plant goes through it and from the pond the water trickles down into the soil and fills the groundwater cavity. Here we have another permeable pavement base with a uh, road we have made so that the footpaths when rain comes from the uh, water from the footpaths per uh, percolates into the groundwater and fills the groundwater cavity. So permeable pavement, it's not like the regular pavement which we use for making roads currently. It is made without sand, making it porous and allowing uh, water to percolate. And it is uh, it requires less maintenance uh, and because it's less likely to give rise to potholes. And it has a lifespan of approximately 30 years compared to the regular pavement which we use, which has a lifespan of 15 years. So how do how did we incorporate this into our model? Well, the industrial uh, wastewater which we get after treatment is uh, sent to a lake which is lined with this permeable pavement. Uh, uh, this allows the water to percolate through the pavement into the groundwater. Industrial wastewater that comes out of an industry per day is 65 liters. Cost of wastewater treatment for this amount of water is approximately uh, 3 to 6 less than 18 less per day. And the amount of land required for the percolation of water is 10 kilometer. And cost of buying the permeable pavement uh, for the land per square foot is 300 to 2000 rupees. What is the amount of land required? 10 kilometer? 10 square kilometer? 10 kilo square kilometer. This, uh, per, the cost of buying a permeable pavement for the land is the per square uh, foot is 300 to 2000 uh, rupees depending upon the type of uh, land pavement. Okay, so purifying water, uh, wastewater has become uh, really uh, important now because they, uh, they contain metals like lead, arsenic, uh, chromium and more metals like nitrogen compounds and so now let's see some ways to purify this. So some ways to reduce industrial waste. The first way is API water separators. The API American Petroleum Institute is a device designed to remove the gross amounts of oil and um, uh, solid pollutants from uh, the uh, waste water produced by industries uh, from chemical temple plants or petrochemical plants or any other um, industrial oil water uh, sources. So this API American Petroleum uh, Institute device is designed by using the gravity um, separation uh, which is based on the Stokes law which defines the rise velocity of oil droplets based on the density and rise. This uh, device is uh, based on the specific gravity difference between the oil and water, which is, uh, the difference is much lesser than the specific uh, gravity difference between the uh, solid pollutants and the water. The specific uh, gravity difference is basically the density of the oil to the density of water. The density of oil is 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 gram per milliliter, whereas the density of water is uh, 1 uh, gram per milliliter. Uh, as oil is um, uh, lighter in uh, lighter than water, it rises to the top, and um, the solid substances uh, pollutants settle to the bottom, and um, the water, the clean water, uh, and, uh, forms a uh, layer in the middle. The oil later can be skimmed off, and uh, the solute, uh, uh, solid pollutants can also be taken off later. The second method of purifying liquid waste is removal of acids and alkalis. Neutralization usually produces a precipitate that is a solid which needs to undergo treatment as solid residue can be toxic. 
In a few methods of neutralization, gas streams are also evolved which require gas stream treatments. Some other methods are also followed follow neutralization. Hardness uh, base streams rich in hardness ions as with the deionization of water uh, dissociate into hardness ions into a buildup of precipitated calcium and magnesium salts. This is harmful to the disposal pipes as it can cause severe furring and also in extreme cases cause the blockage of pipes. This happened once in 1970. So it becomes increasingly important to neutralize the acids and alkalis in industrial waste. This can be done by managing the deionization of wastewater or by disposal to landfills and also by managing the pH level of the released wastewater. way it's decentralized water treatment so um, the uh, polluted water gets very unsafe to use and we cannot waste water so um, it is decentralized water treatment uh, means to reduce the level of contaminants in the water so that it's safe to use again the first way is to waste stabilization ponds um, they um, it's, uh, it's a pond uh, and uh, it is uh, used to uh, reduce the organic matter and to remove pathogens. The second is aerated ponds, that's to um, provide artificial aeration uh, to the uh, uh, water and to uh, produce biological oxidation. Uh, third is constructed bed plants, uh, non-planted filters and technologies making use of anaerobic digestion. So, yeah, next week. So, it's curious that how would it get is relate to the sodium and uh, the water scarcity. So, uh, water scarcity is a major problem. Any problem that troubles the humans is always leading to a psychological problem affecting their minds, which we research and found out that this is one of the problems. What is this in sodium? What is in sodium? Yeah, it's lack of sodium. There are lots and lots of things. That uh, the causes you this is yeah. It's curious that you know how do we relate that? This is one of the main causes of that. And uh, uh, certainly, you, uh, in this paper, you have uh, you know, your main focus was that uh, we are not refilling the groundwater as much as we are taking out, and that's the that's the main. But also there is a one huge factor, which is the reason why even from the, the soil areas which are free, not having holes and all these kind of things, uh, a lot of uh, the degradation is happening in terms of water not effectively going down into the ground, uh, even in those areas. Come across uh, that and any tips or the things in terms of what? is being done to fix that problem. So now we guys must be like, hearing the news about a lot of areas, like pretty much with every monsoon season, you can see areas which are having brought as well as then having collapsed. So a lot of water is coming all over as well. Any, any pointers towards uh, what's the reason for that and what could be done? So I think floods mainly are caused by uh, not proper management of sewage in the city, from which we don't uh, aim to solve this uh, solution. But then, uh, if we provide water the space to percolate into the soil, it will definitely percolate. Even if it takes a lot of time initially, and then later it understands it, it make an aquifer in that place. Uh, 
Uh, so the thing I was pointing towards is that uh, a lot of soil erosion has taken place, and due to that, when you see that in the upper hills in the north, where because of the soil erosion, the water flow happens to be a lot more, takes away the soil, prevents that uh, water if that could have got accumulated, could have gone down to the groundwater at the area which is available. Uh, this type of land is also far more. So the things that could be done in terms of uh, fixing it through that, which is essentially to uh, a large part of it happens to be plantations and all that, but also I a lot in terms of getting that water retained and be driven back. Uh, good job on the presentation. Fundamental question, why have you only chosen an industrial setting? Why not a household setting? Just show off and how many of you have uh, water purifiers at home? Okay. So, if you take out one glass of water from the water purifier, do this experiment. This is actually a good experiment. For every glass of water that you take off of the purifier, if you have your purifier on, See how much amount of water is wasted that flows out of the ocean. You'll be surprised to look at the nation. And given that we live in, we live in uh, what you say, uh, merged communities. You, basically, we have a thousand apartments in uh, 320 acre land. If every household has their water purifier on, continues, just look at the amount of water that is going on. And all of this water is again going back to the same, right? It's going back as an efflux. In fact, uh, old residents of Bangalore uh, know this. There's, there's this song, I think, uh, there, in the of there. There's a, it's a beautiful song. And the river or the water body in which the actor and the actress acted is surprisingly Rishabhavati River. And today, if you go and look at the state of Rishabhavati River, it's bad. You won't find anything over there. In fact, uh, in one of our uh, hackathons at, at our college, we called in a PPMP uh, senior uh, person to ask what can be done to, uh, to at least salvage something out of Vishwapadhi. And unfortunately, the answer is Vishwapadhi is beyond repair. You can't do anything about it. So, this problem that you're stating is multifold. The idea that you have given is, is only going to uh, answer 10%. Industrial waste is 10%. Maybe 25%. 75% comes from household. So if you can make a change from the household itself, if you can find ways how you can save water, because India is a population which has surplus. There is always going to be water scarcity. I have been hearing water scarcity far younger than your age, since my first year or second year. So water scarcity is something that we are always going to face. And this problem is not just India-centric. South Africa uh, faces a water scarcity problem. Uh, California is, is water deficit for the past decade. So this is a very, very major issue. And over that age, water, water, everywhere, not a drop of rain, is actually coming through. So, unfortunately, we are giving you a planet to inherit, which is really, really bad. Unfortunately. So, we have put the onus on you to try and come up with solutions. And the solutions here is far more than trying to raise the aquifers, because the aquifers are gone. We have natural aquifers in Bangalore. It was a beautiful city with so many lakes. Now, thanks to corruption, encroachment, we can point fingers at and say that it is all because of this. But those natural aquifers are gone, they are dead. Belandur uh, Lake was deposited in for the past four years for you know, constantly catching fire, lakes catching on fire because overproduction of methane, because all efflux that is there, all nonsense that is there in the city goes into these things. So these things have to be taken up seriously. And this is where your education is going to be. So by the time you come to a professional course, these are the problems that current students in an engineering college are working on. 
we have tie-ups with DDMD, we have tie-ups with uh, uh, industries where we create hackathons to come up with ingenious ideas to solve these. So I'm heartened at the fact that you have taken up on an SDG. This is called as a societal development tool. There are 19 SDGs that are there right now that the UN or is implemented. And one of these is drinking water, a water crisis. Then you have air, then you have uh, girl child education. There are n number of uh, technology and social related process. So explore it more. Do not narrow your uh, thought process. Because what I, the biggest drawback I find here is you have to look at one particular aspect. And talking about permeable concrete, the biggest challenge over there is it can't take heavy loads. The road is going to crumble like this. I would not use it for roads, you only use it for footpaths. Footpaths also, it's going to go back. In, in India, there's no difference between road and footpaths. <laughs> so, there it is. Uh, thank you, guys. Good job. The littlest of things make the biggest of things happen. Nuclear physics, particle accelerators are all fascinating concepts that we don't completely comprehend. To change that, I invite Advik, Adarsh, Gopichak, Kashi, Kashan, and Shriya Ganesh to present their paper. Good morning, respected judges, teachers, parents, my dear friends. Um, uh, this is Group 4, and we are here with our paper presentation on the topic nuclear reactions and particle accelerators. Let us begin. So the main objective of our uh, project, uh, the research here, is like the various effects of nuclear reactions and the byproducts which are released. There are many harmful effects due to the radioactivity of the products, uh, waste products to be. Uh, second, uh, we would try to plant seed of thought uh, about growing concern and the uh, effects of the particular waste and all the uh, extra byproducts, uh, pollution costs that are. Uh, lastly, we'll be, uh, we'll be giving up, uh, some methods in which we can reduce and cut off the waste uh, used by nuclear reactions. One of the main foundations for the topic we're going to address today is particle physics. So here's a brief about particle physics. Particle physics is, a, is the study of fundamental particles and the forces that make matter. It is also known as high energy physics. Complex structures in the universe are made by smaller objects combining and inter interacting in different ways. Everything in the universe, the stars, the planets, us, and everything we see is made by the same building blocks, particle matter. Particle physics studies these fundamental particles and works out on how the universe looks and behaves the way it does. Particle physics studies the net, studies the nature of the of the particles that constitute ma matter and radiation. Modern particle physics began in the 20th century as an exploration into the structure of an atom. The discovery of nucleus by the gold foil experiment was the foundation for the field. The components of the nuclei were subsequently discovered: the proton in 1990 and the neutron in 1930. Fundamental research on the structure of the nucleus, the, nu the nature of the nuclear forces, and the components of the nuclei require special arrangements and equipments. One such equipment is the particle accelerator. The particle accelerator propels charged part particles such as electrons and protons at high speeds close to the speeds of light. We are pretty sure when we were children, our curiosity has made us think what we are and what are we made of. All these questions can be answered if we dig down deep, literally to the level of atoms and its subparticles. An atom consists of three fundamental particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. We often take it for granted that these particles are the smallest thing that we know, but we have got the wrong mindset that even smaller particles than electrons, protons, and neutrons, such as quarks, gluons, muons, pions, big bosons, etc. A particle accelerator is a machine to study these particles and to determine the functionality and use that would benefit us. Particle accelerator comes under the field of particle physics, which was earlier explained by my friend Gopi. 
The few examples of particle accelerators act, as you can see, are CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, SLAC LINAC at Menlo Park, and BCC, Variable Energy Cycling Centre in India. Particle accelerator has been used in many fields, mainly pharmaceutical research. Particle accelerators has impacted our life through its applications in medicine. Now, I'll be explaining the working and basic idea of a particle accelerator. So, let's say we take two particles, like of, uh, two protons, and we speed them up up to like 99% of the speed of light. We rotate them and like, until they have gathered enough energy and enough speed, uh, we continuously give them more. And on like, the point when we have reached the uh, final peak, we uh, tend to collide them in a particular trajectory. Uh, when we uh, collide them, there, it's not like normal collision which happened in our physical world. Let's take an example of two cars colliding. In the physical world, if the cars collide, their parts would break apart and they would fall. But in the quantum world and the smaller sub-level, when we take two cars, let's take the same example but in the quantum world, when they collide, they disappear for like a second, a fraction of one second and like a bicycle appears. And after that, it turns into two skateboards and blasts away. So, Components uh, of particle accelerators are like the closed chambers and electromagnets which help in speeding up the particles. Uh, radio frequency gravities uh, boost the particles and like, align them to their trajectory. Uh, these particles are uh, collided and observed in observation areas and tanks. Uh, the main uh, idea is when we collide the particles, the uh, particles which emerge and which are seen. Uh, like study and uh, research to apart. But the sad part about these particles are they live up to a very small amount of time, fractional amount of time they survive. I'll be telling you about the applications of a particle accelerator. First one, let's start with element analysis. A widely used technique uh, technic in the oil industry is neutron well logging. In this, we project a ray of gamma rays onto the rock, which helps us to define the composition and log the profile. And the second one is in the medicine industry. Tesla diagnostics radioisotopes to give a lot of info important information when injected into, your, into the organism. Like we can detect tumors, and these tumors can be cancerous, which leads us to the third point, which is radiotherapy. It is estimated that 25 to 30 percent of the world population is going to get cancer in their lifetime. Radiotherapy is one of the most effective way to cure cancer. But um, in, in this, the aim of radiotherapy is to destroy the malignant cells without damaging the surrounding cells. But unfortunately, there's one drawback. When you project um, a ray of, uh, when you project the rays onto the cancerous cell, the surrounding cells get damaged. But the good thing is that we can prevent this by directioning the rays in multiple directions towards the tumor. Nuclear reactions. A nuclear reaction is a process in which two uh, nuclei collide with each other. Sorry. Uh, nuclear reaction is a process in which two nuclei or a Nucleus and an external subatomic particle collide with each other uh, to form one or more sing uh, to form one or more nuclei. So, uh, so there involves there is transformation of one nuclei to another. There are two types of uh, nuclear reactions: nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. Nuclear fusion involves. Uh, two uh, nuclei combining with each other to form one single heavy nucleus. So uh, this type of reaction is mainly found in particle accelerators. Nuclear fusion uh, is in turn the opposite of nuclear fusion. Nuclear uh, fusion involves uh, one neutron colliding with another nuclear to um, forcing it to excite and uh, split into two smaller atoms, also known as fission products. Uh, and additional neutrons are also released from this uh, nuclear fission. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Composer. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Uh, 
Additional neutrons are also ev uh, evolved from nuclear fission, uh, which can initiate a chain reaction. Some harmful effects of this nuclear reactions are the mass destruction caused like Hiroshima and Nagasaki incident and nuclear reactions are also taken place in closed chambers where uh, useful energy is produced. First of all, let's talk about space exploration. It will be surprising to know that the most of the information about space that we have today are uh, because of this nuclear reactions. Let's talk about this very important system used, RPS, Radio Isotope Power System. These are small nuclear power sources which help in the propelling of um, uh, rocket ships in extreme environments. This is the reason we have been able to go through far up talking about the medical field. Medical field is not only limited to the diagnosis but also to the treatment. Uh, nuclear, medical, uh, nuclear medical imaging which basically combines safe administration of radioisotopes along with the camera imaging helps us to note down, helps us to find anomalies and tumors and other illnesses as well. Now projecting the radiation on the skin will not only help kill the cancer This is a great alternative to pesticides. Since pesticides normally end up damaging the crop as well as the soil. It is also used widely in food preservation. The food preservation test this method in irradiation of food will help in preserving it. Its advantages include the you don't need to refrigerate the food anymore. There is no use of chemical uh, pests. Uh, there is no use of chemicals and the nutritional value of not degraded in any way. Now power source. One of the main use of nuclear reactions today is power source. It is one of the main power source that is used on the earth. Massive nuclear reactions are used to uh, the power used by nuclear fissions. Uh, uh, nuclear fissions are actually converted into energy that are used in multiple fields. The advantage of this is it's environment friendly and it produces a lot more energy at once than possible from any other source. Reactions. Let's start with the first one, affecting human population. As we know, radioactive elements are really harmful and this can lead to various diseases like Down syndrome, thyroid cancers, birth disorders, etc. Second point, affecting flora and fauna. Um, after the Chernobyl disaster, like till now, even after 37 years, that place is not habitable. Even though it's habitable, only a few people live there. And we can't find a wide range of flora and fauna there. This is due to the, this is because of the radioactive elements present when the disaster happened. Uh, one more example is that after the disaster, a whole forest of pine trees had to be cut down because it was highly damaged. And the third point is that thermal radiation. On August 6th, we saw a really bad disaster, which was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, during this, the climate was turned upside down, which uh, led to a lot of and the radiation caused widespread death. Um, nuclear reaction is not renewable. Uh, even though uranium is not a you know, fossil fuel, but the extraction is really tedious and uh, it's really expensive. Now, this is leading to the depletion of uranium and we should be careful. Waste to cut off the harmful effects of nuclear reactions. Proper methods of disposing radioactive waste. Unlike other ways, radioactive waste retain the radioactivity for hundreds of thousands of ages of years, even after usage. So it cannot be treated as regular waste is. Take heavy concrete containers are need to are required to store radioactive waste to ensure there is no seepage that occurs. The radioactive waste can't be incinerated or buried. Nuclear tests. 
It has been proven that nuclear power has a lot of latent power which causes destruction. Nuclear tests are not usually ill intended, but the damage they cause is widespread and very large. The radioactive elements that escape during these tests enter ecosystems affecting organisms. It should be ensured that we take proactive measures to ensure that radioactive elements released during these tests do not escape the ecosystem. And reduction of nuclear tests is a priority. Precautions at personal level. Uh, houses near nuclear sites and facilities need to ensure that, that the radon gas levels in the houses are next to zero. And precautions at personal levels. Employees working at nuclear fight, uh, sites and facilities need to ensure they are, uh, they are not exposed to radioactive elements and they carry it with them. So this is the sites and the textbooks that books we use for the research. Uh, so the entire summary and the entire presentation concluded is that however, uh, how cool uh, nuclear reactions sound, that byproducts should always be uh, taken in consideration. The uses uh, have various good effects but as well as bad effects. So keeping, in that, uh, keeping that in mind, we must uh, take a step into reducing and cutting off the uh, harmful effects of the nuclear reaction. Thank you. Thank you. Can you go to the what are the various other research papers you have looked at? Uh, there are many. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other various papers like on Google, uh, we could find other people on the same topic and we uh, some like read and took knowledge from them and included it in the specifics. Uh, I don't quite remember that. No, because you have mentioned a uh, couple of government websites, which is good. And then the important thing is, if you have gone through a research paper, it gives more credibility if you put out the research paper there than going to Wikipedia. Don't rush Wikipedia. Well, this is a general statement for everyone. Don't buy whatever is there because they don't have a vetted process. Uh, anyone can go and mess up the uh, content that is there. So, you got to be very careful on that front. Rather, Research articles are fine and there is a distinction between research papers and articles. Research papers are basically journal papers where it is reviewed by peers. And research articles are articles written for the common public where the language and the terminology and the jargon is dumped down for you to understand, for everyone to understand. So can you please go back, I have a couple questions of you. One more please. Yes, no, 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 this, no, previous, yes, um, here uh, you are saying that you are using radio isotope power systems, uh, can you explain on that front, what, what exactly you mean by radio isotope power systems? Uh, so these particles, uh, they are uh, radio isotopes are the example C10 and C13, C14 carbon, then uh, these are unstable particles. Uh, Every radioactive material is unstable, no, it's a fundamental question. What makes a material radioactive? What does not make it radioactive? The radiation was, uh, okay, I'll give you a thing. The first uh, letter is M. The last letter is Y. The second letter is O. The third letter is S. Good, you just got it. Not Mossy, it's Mossley's periodic law. It's your neutron proton ratio, right? Yeah. So when you have your periodic table, you see the graph. So there is a line that goes through the graph. So every material that lies on the graph is safe. That is the ratio of neutrons and protons in the nucleus 
as long as it is fixed, it's good. The ratio, once it gets disturbed, it becomes a gradient, unstable. Right? So that is Mosley's periodic law. That's how carbon is a stable element. Our skin is made out of carbon. But still, you use the example saying C10 and C14. That they, those are called isotopes because your neutron proton ratio is off. And the interesting thing here is your neutron protons always convert into each other inside the nucleus. A proton does not always stay proton. A proton converts to a neutron, giving off a neutrino and some energy. The other uh, neutron captures that and that transforms into a proton. So further when you disassemble your nucleus, that is where one of the, uh, I think one of you uh, made a statement saying quarks, gluons, pi mesons, pi mesons, you have a whole periodic structure of uh, subatomic particles that come up. Okay? So again, going back to the question, radio power, uh, radio isotope power systems, what exactly do you mean by that? So what I understood by radio isotope, Particles, they are unstable. So the use of them in like, space exploration. But how? How? The, I'll give you a clue. Arc reactor. Who is famous for arc reactor? Lovely. Tony Stark. Iron Man. So what is an arc reactor based on? It's based on. Okay. How many of you watched Iron Man three? Very good. So in that there is one scene, right? He is using what chip in order to control the reaction in his chest? Palladium. Then what do they say about palladium? It is radio. It, it is not suitable for the human body, right? And then he transforms, he, he converts it into a, what do you say? He comes up with a new element, he discovers a new element and why all the problems are solved. Of course, it's not that easy in real life, but the idea that you have to get from there is that your uh, radioactivity is a very naturally occurring phenomenon. Is that clear? So there are certain elements in ground that are naturally radioactive. It's a very, very natural process. In fact, even now we have something called as a background radiation. So our bodies are designed to survive a particular limit of background radiation. You stand here an air conditioner for too long, that is also going to cause you enough trouble because even that is going to give off a radiation. Okay? So that is point one. Point two, you are talking about uh, medical diagnostics and treatment. How exactly are you using nuclear beams? So that is the problem I have here. Nuclear beams are shot through the skin to kill the tumors. Do you have a specific case study for it? Where did you get it from? That is exactly the point. Okay, who wrote that point? Yeah, so where did you get it from? Because in your paper, you have mentioned here at the, at the, at the back that uh, you said diseases. You might not be aware, but cancer is the most dominant radiation disease it's developed over the years. And it is because of radiation effects. But then here you are saying you are using it to clear, treat cancers. So are we treating it or is it causing it? Some particular radiation is causing it and by control teams or to try to get it. Good. Okay, we are getting there on the point. Okay, so there is something called as dosage. So when you are making a presentation, you have to be very, because you are, you are walking a fine line here. You are like a, a, what do you say, a rope walker. You make a mistake, you will fall on either side. So you have to maintain your course. Third point. See, irradiation of food is a good way of conserving food items. Again, what are you irradiating? Don't, please don't make blanket statements. You have to be very specific on this particular point. And radiation always has a drop down effect. That is, you radiate something with radioactive uh, 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 nuclei, it is going to pass it down the food chain. So, if you are going to irradiate an insect, that insect is going to get consumed by a bird. Right. So, now your food cycle gets uh, disrupted. 
So we don't actually use radiation for pesticides. No. We, that's why, why do you think organic farming is so good? Why not drop a nuclear bomb and all insects in there, right? Here's the logic of it. And um, apart from that, um, I think you could have focused a little bit more on what actually is being done in a nuclear reactor. Um, your topic was basically nuclear reactions and most of the nuclear reactions happen in a reactor and uh, as far as science goes, nuclear uh, energy is by far the cleanest energy that we have because the protocols that are established for nuclear safety is uh, very rigid. All right, uh, we have burnt our fingers in a rightly pointed out Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and then uh, Fukushima, the Chernobyl. All these uh, reactor explosions have given us sufficient uh, experience to treat or tread lightly. In fact, uh, 600 kilometers from here, we have a nuclear reactor in India. So, I, I would suggest uh, take all of you there. In fact, they are very welcoming for uh, school students. They they have regular visits to our from school students. It's called Aichika Kalpakam and uh, they have the fast breeder, uh, uh, fast test, uh, fast breed test reactor over there, FPTR. And uh, India plans to open up 10 more nuclear reactors. So if it was not safe, we would not go for it. All right? Not much of this one thing that I, I said that when you were a kid. Think about what are we paid off and why we are here now. I tell you, it's not just the kids. Everybody. Is. This is one of the one of the most uh, persistent question of the human race. I think uh, Sir is uh, uh, covered uh, a lot of the uh, the points, over there. and I think also um, uh, one of the in terms of the nuclear reactions. Um, most of the, a lot of the recent research is going to this. It seems we may be close to having fission based power and in a controlled way of uh, doing that. And uh, that uh, is not going to be having uh, so much of the, uh, the outcome of the dangerous uh, the products and all that. But it's, it's very hard to control and, uh, and all that. And looks like that we are getting there. and. We have the miniaturized sun and a lot of places uh, on the earth, which is uh, which is going to be fulfilling our uh, need. So hopefully, I think uh, in a few decades or a few years, we, we should see that being uh, well established in labs. This we come to an end to our presentations and each and every presentation has displayed the zest of youth to create something new. Now I would like to call Dr. Karthik Shastri to share his message. Uh -huh. I'm just talking here. I'm doing the bad job so you don't have to clap. Anyways, uh, the point is simple, uh, very spirited uh, presentations all around. I thank parents also for being here. I'm sorry for being a little hard on your words, but um, we do have to play the devil's advocate at some point. Um, having said that, um, first and foremost, I'll reiterate a couple of things. When you're here, own it. So, you don't know what I'm going to say next. So, I can take that extra second. And I can confirm. I, I can. I can use this space to uh, say whatever I want. Whatever presentations you have made, I I can see that there's a lot of effort that has gone into it. The first thing I would like to say is, please be careful of where you're referring from. Um, I'm a little skeptical on the fact that most of you have gone to Wikipedia because the moment you type anything, the first link that comes out is Wiki. Please don't trust it. I am happy that, well, from the looks of it, we have not used chat GPT. That's a good point. If you have used it and did it, brilliant. Um, that's a better job that we have done. 
so please make sure that whatever uh, sources that you are using is certified, credible. Go for research articles. There are plenty of research articles on the web. Uh, there are so many websites where you have research papers that are written by the students themselves. So don't get uh, scared when you say uh, refer to a research journal or a research paper. There is plenty of information over there for you to take. Thirdly, try to be as loose as possible on the stage. Don't get stiff. So if I'm standing and talking like this, suddenly you also tend to get stiff because we mirror, right? So uh, the role of a speaker is to put everyone else at ease. Try to be as uh, uh, casual as possible. You make a mistake here and there, that's absolutely fine. Um, I hope you guys will continue doing more and more of this. Don't stop it at this. All right. Try to bring in as much research into your education as possible. So one simple thing that you can do is start working on this problem. You have chosen a problem statement right now. Start building on it. See if it interests you. And then start molding your careers towards it. Because we are going towards an interdisciplinary kind of education from here on in. In fact, as part of uh, NEP 2020, we have started offering electives in the first year of engineering. I'm assuming you are in your 11th and 12th grade. So in a year or two years time, you are going to get to a professional uh, level course. And more often than not, what we find is students take up topics based on peer pressure. What I mean by peer pressure is, take this course because the grading is easy. Take this course because the coursework is easy. There are not, there are not too many math equations. Don't do that. You like math? It's okay. You know, you can, you can, you can spend an extra one hour because you like it. Don't, don't go with the uh, attitude that because my friend is choosing some course, I want to do it. So, um, follow your dream. I see a lot of uh, good ideas that have uh, come out here. And I hope that these ideas are, are built up on in the future also. So, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I would like Mr. Amit Gupta to share his answer. First of all, very good job that uh, being in the head of the you guys have spent a good amount of time to research uh, these areas. And uh, but I think it's what I, I feel it's more important is that you are looking beyond what's there in the textbook and uh, what's being taught in class and looking at the real world application of uh, some of the some of the principles and the things that. One thing that I would say is that, and kind of like those what Shafi was saying, is that uh, be careful with what information you find in the internet and how much credibility that you receive. And you can extend that to the point, and you, some of you might have uh, heard of uh, Dr. Ratsi or not, talk on that particular topic as well at times, is that even things that you found in very credible books and all that, and what is written. Say in the NCRD, it's like a bit uh, that famous experiment of that you take a glass coin and a card, and you pick the heart. Most of the books would say that it is an illustration of the first law of human speech. It actually is not. So, question everything and uh, look at the information that you yourself have gathered. If something is not, you know, uh, turning up good in terms of your own logical things, don't trust it. And even if it is coming from parents, elders, teachers, respectfully disagree with you. In the quest to understand that and that kind of a curiosity, uh, I think is something that uh, I would wish that all of you and all of us retain that for the lifetime. And in this now, the day and age of uh, you hearing a lot of things around the AI and the chat GPT and what's uh, the super AI is going to be, what the sentient things are going to be, uh, a 
lot of things are there. So uh, for sure, one thing that we know for sure is that uh, we don't know that how things are going to be shaped, uh, what's going to be the shape of things in the future. But we know for sure it's going to be quite different and we don't know about it. That much only we know. So what becomes more important is to develop a way to learn to learn, remain flexible, change your thoughts in the process and your what, whatever knowledge you have based on new information that you have. Acquire new skills and those are the ones that would, uh, that would stay with you and would serve you uh, much longer irrespective of whatever location Stay curious. Uh, thank you all for making the presentation. I I really enjoyed it, and I also was noticing some of you has have exceptional stage presence. Uh, some some of you can definitely improve. Even I can improve um, on those things. I really saw that some some of the presentations had depth, some could have more depth in it. It's very easy to look at the Google and uh, you all mentioned that this has been secondary research that you picked it up from somewhere and tried to put it up on PPT. Um, you could do a little more in each one of those research is what I felt in terms of you putting out these questions to get the information, that's usually the part of research, yes, you're right in that sense, where you tend to get the pulse of uh, you know what's happening out there. But you should also add your observation and your thought in it. For example, if you, I, I can pick up on Nika, uh, that is one of the startups that uh, you guys have mentioned. I don't think Palguni Nair would have sent a questionnaire throughout India asking people if they want a startup called Nika, right? She would have done something else. Of course, she would have gone through some other market research, yes. But ultimately, her input, her feel into that has got her, you know, what she ended up doing. So that's a significant one. In a similar way, I also can reflect on Amazon versus uh, Walmart thing that uh, some of you have mentioned. Um, it's very easy to get uh, lost in the balance sheet. You quickly go look at that and then you make a conclusion immediately. I come from you know such a background because what I do is day in day out is uh, get the financial data. Um, Data can be sliced in multiple ways. So try to make, I know it was much beyond your scope for this presentation for now. Try to go much beyond it. And another example that I put was Nika was coming down and LACME was going up at the same time. Uh, it's not a magic thing. There, is, there are some, some more th things hidden within the data. Uh, th those are the things that you know you may want to dig a little deeper. On the COVID guys, all the all the interpretations that you have done, I felt you guys have done fantastic research, I must say. Um, I did not know quite a few things. The recommendations that you, you were trying to give was also good. Um, what caught my eyes was one of the <laughs> cancellation of tickets. Uh, that was uh, very interesting for me. I mean, uh, at least I was not thinking in those lines too much. Um, and I also saw that there has been overwhelming bias towards government needs to do this, government needs to do that kind of things. If you can tilt those things towards what I can do, what we can do, what the private sector can do, and seek help in, in terms of leveraging that, um it will be a lot more better is, is what i felt um again conclusions also don't jump into conclusions uh it would be best to avoid the word conclusion itself it is best to say that these are the interpretations because it's all subject to change 
market and the world is so volatile the moment you get into conclusions you become rigid and um, you are i understand you are in 11th and 12th standard your parents would have been asking you to be conclude which way you want to go uh, yes you can conclude in that direction for now but when it comes to facing you know whatever things are out there don't conclude be open so that uh, you know you can receive a lot of the things that life has to offer each one of you thank you thank you so much sir i request everyone to be patient for the students from other groups to assemble in the auditorium for the closing ceremony i request everyone to settle down i welcome all the dignitaries and the participants to the closing ceremony as we transition to the concluding segment of the event we are honored to invite to the podium our chairman dr c purna chandra rao an embodiment of expertise experience and inspiration to address the gathering please give him a big round of applause dignities of the dais parents teachers my dear students i think all the students has come back oh, good okay okay actually today i prepared very short once you give the mic our they, they say i'm exceeding my timings now today i don't want because already you engaged fully i want to speak very few words no uh you know i am extremely happy to present here on the occasion of our uh, school young scholars Inter interdisciplinary project symposium that is presentation of innovative research paper by interdisciplinary thinking and problem solving every problem has a solution and all you need to do is think critically and creatively how to think creatively here let us understand what dr apj beautifully said learning gives creativity creativity leads to thinking thinking provides knowledge and knowledge makes you great today our students are great yes with this idea of knowledge of our 11th and 12th and students had presented today 15 papers on various topics from different subjects related to commerce and science yes this morning also i was witnessed two three topics in fact now though i i came from commerce i first i want to learn it from other <laughs> segments that's why i went there first and then last i joined here now yeah mm -hmm. some of the their presentations along with the highly learned judges for this program today here here now i would like to touch upon three topics in brief that is autism spectrum disorder in asd and covid 19 effect on industrial relations industry third one asi yes yes sir. artificial intelligence here our students very nicely highlighted two successful enterprises cases that is uh, noika and new startup and amazon mnc usa by utilizing role of e-commerce online shopping to online banking no doubt there will be plenty of scope 
for new startup in future. Because this is the COVID impact, everyone was afraid during the period of COVID, oh, what is going to happen now? But everything is coming normal now. It is not only industry, any real estate or education, everything today has come to better than normal before COVID now. This we can show that one now. So today, this is the scope for all my students now, not of scope for your new startups now. You have to focus on now. Job is okay, always there. But startup is very, very important. Please look into on this particular plan. Artificial intelligence. Yes. If you want to talk artificial intelligence, today also I heard now, lot of advantages on this one now. You want to shift it. But when you are going to do artificial intelligence, very beautiful, everything now, everything is. So many factors now. I heard something like that. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence, so when they are now, question has come now, unemployment. I didn't know unemployment. Are you going to resolve it now? I do not know. More unemployment or more employment more? I do not know. Question see there. No clarity for me. My dear students, you have to tell employment, unemployment. Question here now. Job may be easy. Cost also is there. You have to spend a lot of cost. Beginning yourself a lot of cost is there. Involvement there. Job is easy. I am not denying now. Cost also effect now. So you have to analyze on this one now. Today we can call artificial intelligence revolution now. How earlier, you know, I came from industrial revolution. Industrial revolution, I do not know where you are in industrial. Industrial revolution is for a long period. Centuries together, I can say. I came from that, but I know what they know. Then IT revolution, digital revolution now. We are almost at a digital revolution. Today we are talking of artificial revolution now. Yes, not now, even future also now. So let us prepare for all the things now. Revolution is always there now. Let us prepare. But we should not forget what is earlier. Earlier revolutions now. We should not forget now. If you forgot that earlier revolutions, what happened now? You are forgetting your world, world grandparents, parents, our parents also will forget it now. This is what I want to tell you. Please look into those points now particularly. <clears throat> Regarding particularly, I want to focus on one this one. Regarding ESC, our students have tried to give analysis and help the ASD suffering people and overcome and to control this disorder by improving environment they are in and other methods of treatment. Yes. This is I want to focus here. It is not a disease. Yes, it is not a disease. This is one type of disorder. That's all now. As for the uh, latest population, then more than 10% of the population in the world is suffering this one now. Madam also telling now, more, not 10%, more than 15%. Even schools level also 10%. Every school has taken today what they need. By appointing a special educator, what are maybe doing now? Here, why I want to raise this particular ESC, concentrate. It is a collective responsibility of all us here as citizens. Please understand now. As students, you can do. Today, I ask a question, ESC people, students, have you interacted before who submitted research? Frankly, they said, no. I want to interact. It is not interaction for the research. I met them now today, open I'm talking now. Friendly interact. How can support them? They require moral support. In addition to therapy, gear PC, so many, they, I'm not denying now. Maybe genetic, non-genetic, all the things secondary. But here, moral support required. As a course student, probably you will find in our schools, in schools now, even more schools also, pre-primary, primary level, most students are now. So, you have to make them friendly, support them, don't look them differently. Don't look them differently at all. When you go there, you mingle with them. That is the most important now in school. In society, even your neighbors may have, make them friendly. So wherever you meet them, 
this is the most important my dear students we are lucky god is giving the good health and all why don't you support them this is what i want to please keep in mind for ss in particular you know so no we are sure this this is the good uh, platform for research is uh, starting now um definitely i think this project will continue madam just telling now even we will try to introduce uh, even 9th and 10th also to give some type of awareness you will be advanced stage will be the next this is a beginning for you now definitely in future good platform we are going to give it i mean engineering professors also here now they are also telling only we see in this college level now we are coming to here we are happy there also we have very very eminent personalities are here now in front of you now they will probably already you would have guide you all things now even future also we are trying to take their guidance please understand now not only your teachers even we are taking guidance from them now for your research cell we will do the best one please note that this is not one day job months year it may take three years together please understand now years together cost is different cost effect is different now but at least you understand what you want to do it now so in conclusion i would appreciate all students and faculty for our efforts sincere serious efforts i can say and make a grand success of this one now i wish you all the best thank you Thank you sir for your motivational words. The most important thing is not winning but taking part. The essential thing in life is not conquering but fighting well. On this note, the most awaited moment of the day has arrived. It's time for the announcement of the results. I would like to invite our honorable judges for the science group, Mr. Amit Gupta, Dr. Shweta Panchal and Karthik Shastri. want to speak yeah do we announce the winners uh they'll be announcing the winners and giving the certificates to the participants we don't know who all right um uh while i fill the time um dignitaries of the dais uh, parents and uh, i'd like to address students as my friends um thank you for inviting me um it's been real pleasure to be here and more importantly i'm heartened by the fact that uh, sir you have recommended that you would like to create a research cell and i'd be more than happy to uh, contribute whatever possible from my end and hopefully this association would go on well into the future um as i've been in uh, engineering education for the past 6 years now i just share a couple of uh, pointers here it's not pointing fingers at anyone but these are some basic hard facts that i have observed what i see is more and more students are opting for um computer based courses specifically ai machine learning now i do know most of the parents here are working in the field of computers no disrespect in any way i'm sorry if i'm stepping on your toes but uh what i do see is hardcore engineering courses like civil engineering mechanical engineering they are facing the brunt of this massive shift in fact a recent study has shown that more than 60% of engineering colleges in bangalore have shut down their civil engineering and mechanical engineering departments so this is something that has to be looked at and sir you have come from industrial revolution era it would be painful for you to hear this because 
you cannot use ai to build buildings you cannot use ai to build or uh, move mountains you need some hardcore engineering uh, departments to survive where still ingenuity creativity flows from the human mind into whatever we create and there are very specific skill sets that are required for such departments we want students who are imaginative we are we want students who are creative with their hands who enjoy working long hours you know working on a machine working on a on 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 a fundamental physics concept there's only so much time you can sit and keep knocking on a computer again i'm very sorry to who are uh, involved in computer science i have no uh, hard feelings against you but what i see is more often than not it's because of peer pressure and the obvious fact that the salary packages are very high in ai and computer science that that i see this trend and another heartfelt message to parents is there is a particular um, advantage for rote learning which is basically done for all uh, entrance exams but far more important is creating a scientific temper among students encouraging students to explore the unknown and a fundamental step of research is curiosity so curiosity in a channeled form is what we call research so please try to encourage this as much as possible um i am a product of rote learning i have i have gone from a 7 am to 7 pm uh, college and i know what kind of drills happen over there they they drill the formula into your head and you are like a robo you are writing it in the exam and then you get your grade and you walk out but the moment we ask our students to apply newton's law into a particular field everything goes crashing down they know the formula but they don't know how to apply it so please uh, uh, try to encourage uh, this sort of an education where research in its true form that is the curious form is encouraged and uh, that's my uh, two minutes here thank you we now have the results uh, for the presentations i request the judges to announce them Science first prize is minimum editing minimum. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, we have the uh, results of this competition, but uh, in my eyes and probably all the judges' eyes, all of you are winners. uh just attempting to understand what is scientific research itself makes you a winner okay so applaud yourself for that today okay so uh group 1 was biological science and psychology uh the first uh prize or the first uh, uh person to come uh, the group is genome editing in uh, hiv and aids treatment using crispr cas9 immunotherapy and the students involved are aaron george anandita kumari anushka chauhan sumera afshin Okay now we have second prize winners The second prize goes to Nandana Venugopal and Neela Nenjayan The topic was addition of lithium to antipsychotics to reduce negative symptoms in schizophrenia
Give a big round of applause. Uh, for the physical sciences and AI group, uh, the first prize goes to role of nanotechnology as fuel catalyst in consumer vehicles and transformation. Srinayan Velupula, Vibha Venu, R. Naren, and N. Sangeeta. Um, the second prize is climate change subsidence of oil above groundwater level. Subsidence, I'm sorry. Uh, Yashaswini, Niharika, Mahika, Lakshmi, Rashmi, Gitika, and Lina. I request uh, Mr. Nitin Shastri, uh, sorry, Mr. Amit Gupta to give the uh, winners of commerce section. Hello. So, uh, so the, uh, the winners for the commerce and the humanities sessions, uh, the first prize goes towards COVID-19 impact on industrial and tertiary industry and government reforms. Uh, students are uh, Mirapai, Ramyashri, Midhu, Varshini, Dayamihar, I request uh, Nandini ma'am to come on to the stage, Director of uh, Operations. So, uh, please join me. A round of applause, please. I request Mr. Nitin Shastri to announce the second place for commerce. <laughs> this is the one? Determining the difference in the impact of e-commerce on startups. Bhuvi. And what's the other one? Ritika, Pranav, Shriyansh, and Ankit. Uh, 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all judges. Once again, everyone, let us offer a resounding round of applause for all the winners as well as the participants. With this, we arrive at the culmination of our ceremony. I now invite our Honorable Senior Coordinator, Shakila Sarvanraj, to deliver the closing address. Thank you. Good day and warm good afternoon to our Honorable Chairman, esteemed judges of the day, respected principal, vice principal, parents, teachers, and my dear students. I am pleased to render the vote of thanks on behalf of all the students and staff of the WGS family. A famous quote by Albert Schweitzer says, at times of our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. Today was one such day where our learners got an opportunity to rekindle their thought processes and present their findings about the various happenings in the fields of humanities, science and commerce. This program has taken its shape under the guidance of our visionary chairman. A warm thank you to our honorable chairman whose thoughts has always paved the way for new learning. We felt so happy to have you amongst us and your valuable guiding thoughts has always opened our eyes of new thinking. Thank you, sir. I express my warm gratitude to the judges of the day who amongst their busy schedule have made themselves available for us and by their presence and their valuable suggestions have kindled the spark of learning in our young learners. Your critical reflections have definitely made our learners understand the meaning of research and development. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. A word of thanks will not be sufficient to extend our gratitude to our respected principal, who, has, who was a pillar of support and guided us throughout the planning and execution of the program. Thank you, ma'am. Our love and heartfelt thanks to our beloved vice principal, who, constantly, who, were, who was constantly motivating us and reflecting, has helped us fine-tune our planning. Thank you, ma'am. I'm obliged to our mentor teachers who were constantly guiding our young scholars with their planning and execution of their research works. I also feel uh, happy to extend our thanks to our parents who always have believed in us and stood by us in all the endeavors to shape the future of our young learners. Thank you, parents. Extended gratitude to our admin department who always stand by us in our planning and provide the necessary logistical support. Last but not the least, thank you to our young learners, students, who brought the zeal to the program to their relentless effort and sincerity. Overall, the program has been a wonderful session to learn and reflecting on the learning for all of us. Thank you once again and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. I would take a moment to thank our beloved trustee, Dr. Narendra Shekhar, sir, who has made it possible to come here today. It was a very pleasant surprise for us. Thank you, sir, for making it today and sharing your guidance with us. I would also like to take a moment to thank our Director of Operations, Nandini Ma'am, for being here as a beacon of light and helping us and guiding us all through. Thank you, parents, and thank you, students. Thank you so much, ma'am. To ignite in us the spirit of patriotism, I would like everyone to rise for the national anthem. Himachalayamuna Ganda, 
चल जगधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल गायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे With this, we arrive to the ending of our ceremony. This is I Niharika, Aditya, and Shreyas signing off for the day. It has been an honor hosting this event. Thank, Thank you all you. for being here with us. <laughs>